Well, good morning, church. We're going to start a new sermon series as we enter into October next week in November called Praise and Thanksgiving. Last Sunday, we had a guest preacher with us to do our first Adult D Now. Up on the screen is a theme verse from last Sunday that I think resonated with each and every one of us. Israel, after they've been taken into captivity and taken into Babylon, uh, the prophet Jeremiah was inspired by God to write these words to those people. Living in a day different than what they wanted, wishing they could go back to the good old days, wishing they could go back to their old city, wishing they could go back to their culture, and found themselves now planted in a pagan culture, kind of where the church in America is today. God told Jeremiah to give them this word, verse 7, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you too will have welfare. What we found last week was the challenge that in this day and age, we don't live in Mayberry, we'll never live in Mayberry, but where we live, we are to be a blessing in that place, in that city. We should wake up every day finding a way to be a blessing where God has planted us. If that's on a middle school campus, find a way to bless the Lord on your campus. A high school campus, at work, in your neighborhood, uh, as you leave today and you go out maybe to a restaurant, find a way to bless your city. Just this last week on the news, one of our very own members who is a teacher at uh, John Marshall Middle School was assaulted by a middle school student. Came to find out, come to find out that happens about two or three times a week on that campus. That is a school that is hurting. Uh, there's a group of teachers and administration that need love and support and so this week, we're going to pray for an open door to be a blessing because that's within the shadow of our steeple. And we're going to find out how can we be a blessing in a place that is hurting. I hope when you wake up every day, you're looking for a way to live out Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7. Well, Disciple Now isn't over because it happened last Sunday. Two weeks from this Sunday, we'll be having another guest preacher with us for part two of Disciple Now. We invite you to be back for that day. We'll do the same schedule as we did last Sunday. We have a different guest preacher named Hayes Wicker. I was saved under his ministry. He married me and my wife. Has been a pastor at First Baptist Naples, Florida. Was a pastor to guys like Chuck Colson and other people. Uh, a very significant church. He'll be with us on October 13th. But today we're going to dig into this new series because we're living out a theme this year of what it means to make disciples. A disciple is a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, who in turn, as they are maturing in their faith, also are replicating their faith. They are making disciples. The Bible didn't say that we are to become a disciple as much as it says we are to make disciples, every single one of us. We know that a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ is also a person of worship. But unfortunately, especially even, I would say, to this generation, Worship has become an experience. Worship has become a style of music. Worship has become an hour that happens at church. I want you to see the error of that understanding. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Here's a verse that you've known, but let's dig in on it as we lay out a foundational scripture of what it means to worship God with praise and with thanksgiving. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Go ahead and circle that last phrase, your service of worship. As you take a look at Romans 12.1, you don't see anything about a song. You don't see anything about a church service. You see everything about you and your response to God. You see, worship is bigger than Sunday morning. And worship is not something that is stylistic to a generation. Worship is a day-by-day -day surrender to allowing God to be the Lord of my life. When he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, later on in the sermon, we'll be talking about the tabernacle and their way that they worship God in the Old Testament. It will make more sense what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when you see that diagram, so hold on to what's being said here, but let's learn this. He said, if you really want to know what worship is, worship is more than what our praise team leads us to experience on a Sunday morning. 
Worship is my response to the God who has transformed me. It's something that happens every single day. And he says it happens when I present my body, my person, from my head to my toe. How do you present your body as an act of worship? Well, if you start with the head, that would picture your mind, what you think and what you dwell on, what you feed into your mind. It's an act of worship. When you go all the way down to your heart, it's a picture of who you are, what we think in the head, who we are in the heart. And that's what we worship God with, our heart. It's with our heart that we're saved. And when Christ comes to live within us, we now respond to God with a new heart, a heart of worship, a heart not to be given to other things or to other gods or the things of this world, but the one who created this world. We move from our heart to our hands, and our hands represent what we do. Everything that we do and everything that we say with our lips, all of that is to bring worship to God. How are you doing so far on the checklist when it comes to worship? Then we get all the way down to our feet, where we go, and where our feet take us. The things we did this weekend, were those acts of worship? Or did we allow our feet to take us places we should have never been, and things that fall short of the glory of God? But Romans 12 reminds us worship is more than a song. But now we're going to go to the book of songs, Psalms, if you open up to Psalm 100. The Psalms are literally the hymn book of the faith. Many of these hymns written by David, this one in particular written by David. And it will point us back to how we can go even deeper in our worship of God individually and corporately. Both are important. Psalm chapter 100, if you're there, say uh uh-huh. Verse 1. He starts off, look at his first exhortation about worship. You wouldn't expect this. Obviously, you know, he wasn't pastoring a Baptist church where he starts off and says, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God and he who is the one who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. And his loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness is to all who show up on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Is that what it says? It is to all generations. I want us to break this down. Take some notes as we launch in to what it means to be worshipers of God. First thing he says is that it's okay to be reverently loud. You were probably raised up as a child going to church and your parents were always telling you what? Shh, shh, shh. Well, it wasn't because you were supposed to be quiet in church. It's because you were talking about other things that had nothing to do with worshiping God. That's why they were getting you quiet. But when you look at Scripture, Scripture says we can be reverently loud. Not just a loud mouth preacher preaching at folks, but it's us coming together as the body of Christ and shouting joyfully to who? The Lord. Notice David says, we're to shout joyfully to the Lord. It is a directed shout. It isn't just being loud. Anybody can be loud. Anybody can be obnoxious. Anybody can raise the volume, but it's a directed shout. It's not shouting at somebody that cut you off in traffic. It's not shouting at somebody who disappointed you. It's shouting to the Lord. Now, who does he speak to? Who is to shout joyfully to the Lord? Alex and the praise team, right? That's who should be shouting. They're our worship leaders. We call them worship leaders. Yes, they're to encourage us and exhort us, but it's not to the choir. It's not to the preacher. Look at the last part of that first verse. Shout joyfully to the Lord who? Who? All the earth. That's everyone who's taking a breath right now. Anybody standing on planet earth, David says, shout joyfully to the Lord. This isn't just for outgoing folks who have an outgoing personality. This isn't just to, like I said earlier, the choir. This isn't to certain denominations like them charismatic folks that get all loud at church. This is for everyone who knows the Lord. David said, everyone and everywhere should be reverently loud. Shout loud to the Lord. It's not just about being loud. When he was talking about these shouts, it was a a specific thing he was speaking of. 
It, it loses translation in our culture about the only way we can get it. it. It doesn't happen what happened in his day like it does ours. About the closest we can get to this is when your football team comes running out of the tunnel onto the field. And everybody stands to their feet, and what do they do? It's my team. Go team. Go team. They get on their feet, painted faces, wearing the jerseys, wearing the colors, and they shout to the top of their lungs for their team to have victory. When David was speaking of shouting joy for the Lord, he was speaking from a personal experience. Something that was relevant in their culture. You see, in those days and ages, when you lived in a city, when you lived in a nation, all nations had their kings. The king was responsible for protecting and providing for their people, for a nation. To defend them from the enemies that wanted to conquer their cities and take their children and take their lives. And often kings and warriors would go out on behalf of the people and they would defend the people. They would fight in these great battles. Lives would be lost. And in the end, the winning king would return home to his city. And as he returned back, there would be a great parade, a great procession of the king and his warriors. And as they would come through the main street of the city, everybody would line both sides of the road, and they would shout to their king, giving him praise, thanksgiving, and accolades. Why? Because they had victory. David, who'd received those kind of fanfares and those kind of parades and those kind of shouts, realized he didn't deserve any of that. That all the shouts should not go to a king on this earth, but the king of king who's above all the earth. And so David begins here and he says, no, you direct your shouts above. Not to any man, not to any person, not to anything. You give all your energy, you give your worship to the God Almighty, the God of the universe. Flip back two chapters to Psalm chapter 98. David says it again. Psalm 98, verses 4 through 6. Again, he declares, shout joyfully to the Lord. They knew what he was talking about. They knew he was pointing the victory song to the one who gives victory. When you came in this morning, you didn't come to just sing songs with our praise team. We came to gather together corporately to celebrate the victory that we have in Christ. And you may be facing a battle right now. The enemy may be trying to steal your joy. He may be surrounding you where you feel like you're trapped. But I want you to understand, we are more than conquerors. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? A conqueror conquers, but to be more than a conqueror means you can never be conquered. There are many who have conquered in battle but would face defeat later in their careers. As a believer, we cannot be conquered because the King of Kings is our champion. He is the one who provides and he is the one who protects. So David said, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre, the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the King, the Lord. Our shouts of worship are not just to be loud, but also to be joyful. So go back to Psalm 100 now. We see that in verse 2. He says, shout to the Lord. We see that we're also to come today with joyful singing. For he says in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Now knowing I was getting ready for this sermon, I had our media team install a camera right back here in the back that has been videotaping you the entire worship service. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it up on the screen. The screen's going to come down. It is down. And, and we're going to transfer over, get ready to p- play the video. And, and I want you to pick yourself out. I don't know which song they chose, but find yourself and, 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 and ask yourself this question. Have I been living out Psalm 100 this morning? Have I been shouting to the Lord today? Or have I just been sitting in a chair? Have I been singing joyfully? Or have I just been looking around? You ready? I'm not going to show that. You wouldn't let me come back next Sunday if I did. Some of you are really nervous right now. I'm watching out there going, oh. Every once in a while, I'll sit in the back on purpose just to, to worship with you, but also as a shepherd just to see how we're doing in worship. There's a lot of us in here today, man. Praise God for a great crowd. That's, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here. Why are you here? 
Did you come just because you're supposed to? Did you come because somebody made you? Or when we entered this place, did we come with hearts of victory? Did we come for one purpose and one purpose alone? To worship him who has given us our victory. Man, we ought to be juiced. We ought to be anticipating that moment we get to gather together for a purpose. And that's to worship him. To gather with shouts of joy. To sing joyfully to him. This should be happy hour. Oh, that bothered some people. You know why? Because the world has stolen happy hour. Happy hour for some people, something happens at a bar where everyone gets to be friends. That's for the parents, not the kids. You don't even get that, but that's all right. The ones who get it, the young ones, how about happy hour is what time at Sonic? <laughs> Two to four. <laughs> they have bred us to be happy hour people. We live by two to four. Happy hour ought to be when the church gathers together. It ought to be the happiest hour on planet earth. May the bar not steal it. May Sonic not get it. May the church live it every day. Go to verse 3. David says, we're to shout to the Lord. We're to sing joyfully. Why? Because he is the Lord. He's the creator of all things. We aren't. He is. And yet if we're not careful, we forget that. It's easy to forget he is the Lord and we're not. You see, what we do reveals what we really believe. In Sunday church, on Sunday morning, in Sunday school, we'll answer, he is the Lord. On Monday through Saturday, people are watching our lives, they wonder who our Lord is. Because you see, we kind of take that throne. It's my day. It's my attitude. It's my schedule. It's my desires. It's my want to. David had to remind him, no, the Lord, he is God, and you're not. You didn't create anything except a mess that he had to clean up. He's the Lord God. Elijah, Elijah had to remind Israel the same thing. You see, it's inherent in man to know he's God when we're in trouble, but forget he is God every day of the week. Israel woke up, and they were worshiping false gods, a god named Baal and Asherah, and and all kinds of other things, and they had turned their back on God because they didn't need God anymore. They were prosperous, kind of like our nation. We don't need God. We got everything we need, or so we think. Elijah drew a line on that mountain and said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Can't have it both ways. You can't just act like you're the people of God one day, and on the rest of the days just act like you're just like every other pagan on the planet. If you remember what happened on Mount Carmel, God threw down fire to prove that Elijah was representing the one true God. And then there was all the false prophets of Jezebel. And in that moment when God displayed his glory and when God showed up, the Bible says that all of God's people fell on their faces. And you know what they said? The Lord, he is God. Exactly what David was saying, know that the Lord himself, he is God. That's what they had to discover on that mount, and that may be what somebody has to discover this very morning. He is God and you're not. And when you come to understand that, it's not God taking control and putting you in chains, it's God setting you free. Never been more free than when I discovered I'm not God, and when I was and when I played God, I messed it all up. But as soon as I gave my life to Almighty God and realized He was God and I wasn't, that's when I came to know the joy of salvation. For He is the shepherd and we are His sheep. So because of that, go to verse 4 now, Psalm 100, verse 4, and dig in with me right here for just a moment. Don't miss this. For there's a phraseology used in verse 4 that if you don't understand the context, you miss some powerful things in this one verse. Look at it. So he says, because he is God and we're not, because we are the sheep and he is the shepherd, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with, you know that song? Some of the parents in the room, we grew up on that song. That was our praise song when we were back in the youth group. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. I'm not going to sing it to you, I'm going to read it to you. Yeah, I know you're disappointed. You'd be even more disappointed if I kept on in song. And the point is this, he was teaching them how to go deeper in worship. Now, we made it a song. David was trying to teach 
worship. And here's what he was teaching. Take a look at this diagram of the tabernacle on the screen. Can't see it real well, but there was the tent of meeting, the Holy of Holies, inside a curtained off walled area. It was the tabernacle. This was not designed by Moses. It was not designed by David. It was designed by God, given to man to teach them about worship. All of this was spelled out by God how to build the tabernacle. This was before the temple. Now, you don't see it real well in the picture, but the walls all the way around that enclosed the Holy of Holies and the temple or, or the tent of meeting, those were white linen walls made out of white linen stretched together to create the barrier all the way around. On this bottom right-hand side, you can't see it well, but that was the gate of entrance. It was on the east side of the tabernacle. It was a picture of man who walked out of the garden and exited out to the east. You can read about it in scripture. It was a picture of the fact that there's only one way to meet with God. Only one way in. There was only one door. In this auditorium, you can enter in from multiple ways. If you were going to the tabernacle, you had to go through the gate. There was only one entrance. We'll talk about the reason of that in just a moment. As you entered in to worship God, you then found yourself in the court of the tabernacle. That whole area there. You see a courtyard. You say, what's the big old honking uh, Chick-fil-A cow doing in the tabernacle? That's where they sacrificed animals for their sins. It was a place of sacrifice. There was an altar right there in the middle of the courtyard where you would present your sacrifices. And then the innocent blood that was shed would be taken by the priest into the Holy of Holies for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. David and his people daily went there to worship God. And as they went, they first had to enter through the gate. Let's talk about that gate for a little while. That gate was not made out of just white linen. It was a uniquely different section. It's how you knew where the door was. And it was made out of a three-color woven linen. Listen to the three colors. Write them down. First color was blue. Second color was purple. Third color was red. And they would take those different strips of linens. They would weave them together in a very ornate door panel out of blue, purple, and red. Why those three colors? The blue represented the deity of God. That he was God and they were not. The purple was a picture of royalty. That he was their king. Not David, not Saul, not any man. But God was to be their king. And then the way that we experience him as our king is through that red linen. And you know what the red stands for. It was for the blood that was shed on the altar. It was a picture of the blood of the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. It was a picture of King Jesus, who was God, not just a man, but God who became flesh. Who wasn't just a prophet, he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who would lay down his life so that through the shedding of his blood, there might be forgiveness of sin. As you look at the gate today, as you see it as it was described in scripture, what they walked through every day was pointing to Jesus. Look at this verse up on the screen. Keep the gate in mind. John chapter 10, verse 9. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the, I am the what? The gate. I am the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in, and he will go out, and he will find pasture. Take a look at that diagram again. As you look at that diagram, the only way you could be a worshiper of God is you had to come through the gate. That gate wasn't a Baptist gate. That gate wasn't a gate of works or deeds. It was a gate that was available to anyone who was willing to come through that entrance. There were no soldiers at the gate. There was no one barring people to come in or come out. It was available to anyone who wanted to enter. But you had to come through that red, blue, and purple gate. 
And that's true for anyone in this room today. The only way you can be a worshiper of God is not by being in a church today, in a worship service. It's by being in Christ Jesus. The one who so loved you, he gave his life. He demonstrated his love for you and for me. And while we were sinners, he died. There's the red linen, the blood of Christ. So David says, as we enter, we don't just go through some little fancy little piece of linen. We're coming through the priceless blood of Jesus Christ. We have access to God now because God removed our sins by dumping them all on Jesus on a cross and removing them from us. Does that make anybody thankful this morning? Can you be thankful for that? Do you think that might be a place to start and worship? God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for being the way, for being the way to God. So David says, if you want to worship me, enter the courts with praise, but come through the gate with what? Thanksgiving. If you've been through the gate, you find your way into the court, the courtyard of the tabernacle. And I told you earlier, that's where you find the altar, and that's where you would lay your sacrifice. You would bring an innocent lamb or an innocent animal. It would be sacrificed. It would give its life. Why? To cover your sin. The innocent for the guilty. You would lay that on that altar, and then that blood would be collected as a sacrifice to be taken into the Holy of Holies. Look at Psalm chapter 27 and see if this starts to make a little more sense. Remember Romans 12? Present your bodies as a living what? Jesus was the one-time sacrifice. And when you receive that, when you enter the gate, you now are redeemed. You are a new person in Christ. And from that day forward, every day you wake up, you present yourself on the altar. You now are the ones that said, Lord, I surrender to you this day. All my body, all my person, God, is yours. It is your act of a living sacrifice. Psalm 27, verse 6 says this, Now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. It's amazing how many Folks show up at a worship service and just stand there or sit there or process an hour and miss the heart of worship. Hey, listen, there's some of us that never need to ever show up on a recording anywhere. There are some of us, ears do not need to hear on this earth our sound. But every one of us have a sound that need to be heard in heaven. When I sing, I'm not singing for you. I'm not singing just to blend in the audience. I sing because I have victory. I sing because I have a Savior. I sing because I'm a new man. I sing because I have all this to be thankful for, and I want to come, and I want to sing, and I want to shout, and I want to praise his name. But I have to come first through that gate, the gate of colors. And everybody's got their colors, don't they? How many, if I said orange, would start shouting this morning? You got any orange in here shouting? Yeah, (laughs) undercover, I get it. If I said crimson and cream, if I went... (laughs) Let me give orange another shot. Orange! Okay, that's all right. Now, if you were in the stadium yesterday, it was a whole lot louder than that. But we do have the crimson blood of Jesus. It's all of our colors. And I'm not just trying to tie that back in any, any, any ungodly way. I mean it literally is stay on the holy. That color ought to get you juiced more than any other color on this planet. And when we come together and we celebrate the blood sacrifice of, of our Savior, when we come to celebrate our victory, we better be louder here than in any stadium on the planet. We should be shouting. We should be praising God. And I'm going to give you seven days to practice. And if I have to put a camera in here to get you guys to figure it out, I'll do it. Don't make me do it. Show up. Not just on Sunday, but tomorrow morning when you get up, 
Guys, freak your parents out. Don't shout at them. Shout to the Lord. Don't shout an alarm clock, mom and dad. Get up and start shouting and set Spotify to go off on your phone if you have to and start with a praise song on your lips. Get crazy with it. Wake the neighbors up. Wake our city up as we learn to shout to the Lord. I bet we sing that next Sunday. Hebrews 13, 15. Look at what it says in the New Testament. Through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. Go back to the diagram of the, temp- of the tabernacle one more time if we could. So get this. When we worship God, we get to worship God because Jesus lives in us. We enter the gate with what? Enter the gate with thanksgiving. Did you enter here this morning with a heart of thanksgiving? Or did you enter in here with a kind of chaotic heart, an angry heart, a frustrated heart, or a heart of thanksgiving? Yeah, there's frustrating things in this world, and there are things that get to us. There are things that drive us nuts. There are people who drive us nuts. But he is God, and we are not. And we can enter his courts with thanksgiving. And then as we make it into the courtyard, praise God, we don't have to bring innocent animals anymore. We can bring the sacrifice of praise. What's the difference between praise and thanksgiving? We're going to focus on that over the next two months. The month of October, we're going to reverse it. We're going to focus first on praise, who he is. And then in November, we do what we always do in November. We'll focus on thanksgiving. Is that all right? But every day... We give him praise, and we give him thanksgiving. Why? Look at verse 5, and we close. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. God is good. That's where you say, all the time. All the time. Where does that come from? Bam! Verse 5. He's good, even when we're not. Number two, his loving kindness. Can you praise him? Did you praise him because he's been good to you? I hope so. Second reason. His loving kindness is for the perfect people. His loving kindness is for those who show up on Sunday morning. Or his loving kindness is for who and for when? It is everlasting. Can you praise him for that? How about the third thing? And his faithfulness is to all generations. I challenge you to spend the next few weeks, next few months, learning what it means to give him thanksgiving and praise. Pray with me this morning, if you will, with every head head bowed, every eye closed. This is not a time to shout yet. This is a time to reflect. This is a time to respond, for God's word will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose in which God sent it out this morning to your heart and to mine. So what is your response? For some, your response might be, I can't worship God because I don't know God personally. That was me for a long time. I went for nine months to a church. I sang with them some of the songs they were singing. Back then, we sang out of books called hymnals. That's how far back I go. And I would sing those words, but I had no clue what I was singing. I knew there was a God in my head. I didn't know God in my heart. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you've gone to church a lot of your life. Maybe you're familiar and could answer all the questions asked in Sunday school. But maybe you can't answer this question. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? They had to answer. Peter said, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, well done. Flesh and blood could not have taught that to you. Only my Father could have revealed that to you from heaven. And maybe God's revealing that to somebody here this morning or somebody who's worshiping online. And you realize all of a sudden now it's not enough to know in your head there is a God and believe. Even the demons believe. But you have to believe in your heart. There has to be a time in your life where you confessed your sin and said, God, you're God and I'm not. I give you control. I invite you to be the king of my life. And you surrender your life to him. Has that happened? 
that's happened for you, would you raise your hand all over this room? Raise it high and say, he's my king. I know Jesus. I've invited him in to save me. Thank you. You can put him down. Is there somebody here this morning you couldn't raise your hand because you've never opened your heart to Jesus? And right where you are, say, man, I don't understand all that. I didn't either. I just knew what I was doing wasn't working and that I needed to trust God's word for what it said, that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And the only way I could be saved was to believe in my heart. I gave my life to Jesus. So you need to do that right where you are. You can say, Lord, that's me. Save me. Lord, I need to be saved. I've sinned against you. Just tell God that. He already knows it. He wants you to admit it. Just tell him. Then the Bible says eternal life is a free gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. None of us do. But a gift is only a gift if it's received. Maybe there's somebody here right now you need to receive that gift and say, God, I receive the gift of eternal life right now. I receive you into my heart. If you just did that, we'll stand in a moment. I want you to come to one of our ministers. I know that's not comfortable, but I don't think the cross was very comfortable as Jesus publicly displayed his love for you. And I think Scripture says, Jesus speaking, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Come to one of our staff and say, today I prayed with a pastor. Today I nailed it down. Or this past week, this past month, I've trusted Jesus. I just want to confess that. They'll pray with you. We want to encourage you and help you take the next step. And then if there are those in this room, you've already made that decision. You've already trusted Christ. But you're not living the heart of a worshiper. Ask God to change your heart right now. If you're here today and you don't have a church family, it could be that you need a place where you can come together and shout joyfully with other believers and celebrate the victory you have in Christ. We invite you to come as we receive members. Whatever your decision, do it for the glory of God. Father, that is our prayer. I pray in these next few moments that just by coming forward or just by responding through prayer, that would be our shout today, declaring that you are God and we are not. Lord, be honored in these next few moments, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, my name's Breland. You're watching Connection Points, and here's what's going on at PCBC. Our New York City mission trip is taking place on December 4th through the 8th. The cost for the trip is $750. Remember that the first 25 people to sign up are guaranteed a spot on the trip, and the sign-up deadline is today. So if you want to join the team, email Miss Debbie at dhay at pcbc.tv. Friends 55 and Up Pioneers is happening this Thursday, October 3rd at 10.30 in the morning. As always, we'll have bingo, food, and great entertainment. For the moms, Mom to Mom is happening this Friday morning at 9.30. Come craft with other moms while we've got your child care covered. And this year's PCBC Car Show is happening this Saturday right here in our front yard. Come on out and join us. We'll be here until 3 p.m. And because October is almost here, starting next Sunday, we will officially be collecting candy for Festival. Every year, Festival is an incredible time for us to welcome in our community and provide everyone with fun and lots of free candy. And as always, we wanna make sure to give out the good stuff. So starting next week, please bring in your Festival candy and leave it in the lobby. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Breelin. We hope you have a great week and we will see you soon. All right. Got a couple we want to introduce to you. Before I do that, let me say this real quick. You will notice on your way out that there are stations set up where we'll be collecting candy for Festival. Believe it or not, fall is among us and Festival will be here before you know it. So please. Uh, next time you're in Wally World or a store very similar, grab some candy, drop it off. We like for everybody that comes through our doors on Festival, which is well over a thousand people, we like for them to leave with bags and bags of candy. So please grab some candy, drop it off, and also in the next week or two, we'll be starting our annual coat drive uh, for Wally Post Elementary. And this year, we're also adding our New York City trip on that as well. So in past, it was just coats for little kids, kind of replace coats for little kids that lose coats. But we're also going to be uh, receiving adult coats as well because we're going to be giving away coats 
uh, in the area of some of the church plants that we work with in New York City on the street as a way to serve their community. Here we give cookies to businesses. There we give coats because it's a lot colder there than even it gets here in Oklahoma in our icy days. So if you want to start bringing in coats, I was told to please bring in new coats though. Let's not clean out our closets and bring old ones for this particular drive. There'll be new coats. So if the Lord lays it on your heart to purchase a coat for a kid or an adult in New York, you just do what the Lord leads you to do. With that in mind, let me introduce to you Mr. Bradley Williams. Come on up, Bradley. And Alicia, you come out with him. Bra what is it? Oh, it was spelled B-R-A-D-Y? Yeah. That's Brady. Yes. Amen. I've, I've been, to, I've been, I have an edumacation. Brady. Why did I say that? All right. Let's welcome Brady Williams. Give him a hand clap if you would. Brady made a decision to follow Christ in 2006, been through believer's baptism, and comes today by statement. If you affirm that, let me hear a praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And be praying for them. They're actually getting married in March. So be praying for Brady and Alicia. Awesome. And let me make sure I say this one right. Miss LaDon. Miss LaDon Martin, and she's coming by transfer of letter, and we're going to let Miss LaDon remain seated here. So if you affirm her in coming by transfer of letter, let me also hear a praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Awesome, awesome. And if you would, on your way out today, come by and welcome Brady and congratulate this couple, and also welcome Miss LaDon. Whatever you do, though, as we're dismissed, remember that God loves you, and so do we. Have a great week.